Hello, welcome to Analyse This, Mental Health and Film and TV. I'm your host, Dr Boo. I'm a clinical psychologist, and each episode I'm joined by a guest to chat about films and TV series from a psychological perspective, including whether the portrayals of mental health difficulties and therapists on our screens is accurate. In today's episode, we're looking at the film Cake, directed by Daniel Barnes. This 2014 film bought Jennifer Aniston nominations from the Screen Actors Guild and the Golden Globes for her portrayal of a woman suffering with chronic pain after a car accident. I am in a lot of pain. I know. You may know, but sometimes I suspect that you think I'm this uncooperative old bitch who's just making all of this up. My guest this week is Dr Hannah Bashforth, a clinical psychologist who specialises in the assessment and treatment of chronic pain conditions. We'll be talking about chronic pain, trauma and opioid addiction and ask, does the film recognise the importance of psychology in chronic pain approaches? And what about the depiction of therapy in the film? Well, Dr Hannah will tell us why she was so incensed with what she saw that she thought the therapist should be struck off. Welcome, Dr. Hannah, to the podcast today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I know Hannah from medical legal work, first and foremost. We met at a conference in Cambridge in a very Cambridge University type room. It was all very wood panelled and full of older white men, really. We kind of spotted each other from across the room, knew that we were both psychologists, just without even saying a word. We knew in the field of psychiatrists and barristers that we were probably the psychologists in the room. And we were both there because of our interest in medical legal work and in pain, particularly. But Hannah, how did you get interested in chronic pain conditions? Yeah, good question. Um, it sort of happened in, in kind of a an unravelling type way. So I... Um, did my elective placement in my declin year in physical health, which I absolutely loved, um, which was kind of across the spectrum of lots of different specialties, really. And I did my doctoral thesis in breast cancer. Um, but my final placement was in a chronic pain service at Salford Royal Hospital. And I just knew it was for me straight away, um, primarily because of the interdisciplinary working and being with other disciplines and just feeling like working in lots of different ways to help the same individual, but not being only reliant on my skills was just something that just, well, I fell in love with really and have, have stayed with it. That was kind of 2006. And then since then, I've kind of exclusively been in physical health settings as a qualified psychologist. Uh, with a specialism in chronic pain um, and that, that's kind of me really so that that was yeah from 2006 how many years that not very good at maths <laughs> on, <laughs> on a Saturday evening after a few sips of gin yes. <laughs> a fair few more, years more yeah. years more years than, we, <laughs> than we'd like to probably acknowledge has passed since we were graduated from our doctorate courses and we both do medical legal work so back when I started doing that about 11 years ago I found myself seeing a lot of people who'd had road traffic accidents and and often the very standard whiplash that generally gets better in a certain amount of time, but enough people who didn't get better within the sort of prognosis time given by orthopaedic surgeons or GPs for me to start thinking what exactly is going on there. I want to know a bit more about that. So having chatted with Hannah a few times, I've ended up doing a master's in pain management approaches up with the University of Edinburgh and learned so much about chronic pain from that and from our discussions, especially post-accident or incident-related chronic pain. So the, the kind of people we see, both um, Hannah and I see quite similar people in the sense that they've often had medical, in, in our medical negligence worlds, people who've often had some kind of trauma um, or difficult incident in their lives, which is then led to triggered or amplified pain. And I think it would be quite 
interesting to look at this film, Cake, from exactly that perspective, because this is somebody who and either one of us could be seeing in our medico legal clinics. Mm. So for people who don't know, in medico legal work, when somebody's had an accident and goes through their insurance company, whether it be because they've had an operation that hasn't gone well and there has been a breach of duty, or because they've had a car accident, their solicitors at some point will often instruct a psychologist or psychiatrist to look at the emotional impact of the accident that they've had so that we can identify whether somebody's difficulties psychologically are attributable to the the accident or the incident that they've had, whether they've had any history that may be uh, exacerbating or causing the difficulties over and above or in addition to that incident. And also to talk about any treatment that they might need and any sort of prognosis that they might have. And Cake is, as I say, exactly that kind of, that's exactly the kind of person that we might see, I think, walk through our doors. Mm, Absolutely. So this is somebody who has had an accident. We don't find out for quite a long way through the film exactly what's happened, but she's, by the end of the film, we are aware that she's had a very, very bad car accident which has resulted in both her having operations and this chronic pain and also the death of her child. And then you end up with all the other outfall of that, which is she doesn't work anymore. She's being looked after a lot by somebody who I think I always had the impression probably used to be their housekeeper. I think she's always been around. Silvana, I think her name is, the housekeeper. Yeah, Yeah. she's a very maternal figure in the film. Yeah, seems to be the only person that the main character hasn't pushed away. And, yes, has lost her marriage. And she's an individual suffering massively. Mm. So thinking, though, that's the brief overview of the film, but thinking about what chronic pain is and thinking about that interplay between this horrible trauma that she's gone through and the pain that she is experiencing... Hannah, what are your thoughts about how to describe from a psychological point of view what we're seeing there, considering that still people still hold on, I think, to a real dualistic model mm. of mm. pain is one thing, psychology is another thing. And she's a yeah. prime example of how that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I mean, we'll come on, I'm sure, to talk about kind of general feelings about the way that the, the film presents chronic pain. Um, I, I think that there were a number of lost opportunities in the film to do so entirely effectively, which I'm sure we'll kind of talk about. But um, I think it's really important to understand that it's not helpful to consider chronic pain in this notion of is the physical pain that somebody's experiencing as a result of kind of an underlying psychiatric or psychological trauma. Or is this physical pain due to some kind of physical injury that's evident on scans or sort of medical assessments? Um, This idea that we experience pain for one of those two reasons and never the twain shall meet, in my view, is kind of very archaic. Um, But yeah, and it's interesting because you talk about the medico-legal world, and I know that both you and I have spoken extensively um, in the past about it's kind of a square peg in a round hole the law wants uh, facts it wants clarity you know is this pain real is, is this pain a psychological issue what's you know what's happening here but actually both you and I know from from our work and, and studies that this is much more helpfully conceptualized in terms of understanding the interactions between the psychological and the physical um, and, you know, we, we use this terminology all the time, the biopsychosocial model and understanding how the biology, what's going on in our bodies physically, whether we can see it or not. You know, we, we all know what stress feels like. We all know what it's like to feel panicked butterflies in the stomach. You know, I was thinking the other day and I was preparing a presentation for something. And actually, in common parlance, we use language, don't we, like sort of heartache and gut-wrenching and uh, lazy bones, things like this. And actually, you know, we're just kind of implicitly linking emotions and the body, aren't we? Even in the way that we talk. 
but yet actually when we think about mental health and we think about physical health we all kind of compartmentalize it in a really unhelpful way um and you know i'm sure we'll come on to discuss it but i, I felt in some ways the film unhelpfully played in played into that rather than looking at the kind of the space in between the mind and the body the interaction it kind of wanted to separate it really yeah i agree i think that there was a real feeling that yes obviously she has psychological problems but she also has this pain and there was a moment where she speaks to her physiotherapist her well, hydrotherapist physiotherapist by the poolside nearing the end and says that that i'm in real pain and i think sometimes people or you don't believe me and and I I mean I hear that so frequently one of the I think hardest things sometimes for somebody who's going through litigation and who is suffering from pain and really just sees their pain as being their primary difficulty is to be sent to a psychologist for an assessment because they're like but it's not in my head and it's trying to get the message across to both that person and to the solicitors and to the judge ultimately because that's who we talk to that there is a this dynamic interaction between the the pain itself, the physical, medical side of it, and the social factors and the psychological factors. And they all influence each other to the extent that actually chronic complex pain can develop. And actually it then becomes, it pushes itself through this process where you end up with this fear avoidance where people are aware that there are, that if certain movements are going to cause them pain or, or could make their condition worse, they end up, having these catastrophizing thoughts and and interpreting pain in a very sort of frightening way a lot of negative mm. beliefs about it and the consequence of that is further disuse because the person then doesn't do their normal activities and depression and actually there's some evidence that there's a disruption of the pain inhibitory pathways so your pain mm. tolerance is decreased even further and that's even before we start talking about adding opioids into the mix. Oh, absolutely. I mean when I think about in my clinical experience some of the narratives that patients that I see have been given by say surgical colleagues not not wishing to sort of tie them all with the same brush but you know oh we've had a look at your spine and it's crumbling or um you know messages that people receive in A&E about you must wear this neck brace, but no kind of timeline given because your head is is like a, a sausage on a cocktail stick. Uh, you know, it's going to snap snap any second. And, you know, you think actually for some people, perhaps with particular psychological vulnerabilities or uh, health anxiety or certain life experiences or other comorbid health problems, these are really frightening messages. And actually they penetrate deep. And, you know, as you, you've talked about there, it's about the relationship between how we then think about our bodies affects how we behave and the choices that we make about what we do. You know, if somebody told me my head was like a sausage and my neck was like a cocktail stick, I'd wear the neck brace for 15 years yeah, <laughs> and I'd lose absolutely. all the muscles in my neck. You know, it's kind of common sense, really. I, I You know, the, and, and I think the thing that I find quite upsetting is often... Sometimes by by the time people come to see me, you know, they're kind of bagged up as as mad, really, or like you know, not as as, as life's poor copers or people yes. that you know can't can't cope with normal stress and strain. But actually, they are a collection; they're a tapestry of all of the things that have been told to them over the years about their pain. Um, yeah. Lots of mixed messages because the problem with pain is it's a subjective experience and it can only really be subjectively described in the same way that, you know, I look at something and I say that's red, you look at it, you say it's red, but we'll never know we're seeing the same thing. You know, my my seven out of 10 pain might be different to your seven out of 10 pain. And therefore, you know, in medical legal settings, you know, we see it time and time again. It's it's so easy to invalidate or undermine people's pain experience because of the sort of lack of perceived rigor of the subject of subjective criteria, which I just think is is difficult, really, particularly in a litigation setting, which where you know people people want to kind of uh, reduce the loss uh, that's evident. It's tough, isn't it? Absolutely, and you and you're right. You have that thing 
I think it's British Pain Society as and many others. The basis pain is pain is what somebody says it is, and to invalidate that and to say that it it should be less than it is or that person must be exaggerating or have to poor pain tolerance and things like that. It's it, it's considered actually a very it's a very negative thing so that I um, can't tolerate pain very well as if that's an, a, a terrible personality trait to have that you are just yeah. particularly sensitive to pain and it's sort of it's odd the collective views that we have about these things and how they change over time so you know there was a point when you had backache you lay down that's what you did and it's hard for some people to realize that that isn't the best thing to do regardless of what they're told because it feels better when I lie down and I don't try and move and if I went into the I don't know, the uh, orthopedic office and I saw the little model of a spine they've got where each disc can be taken out and somebody tells me my disc has slipped you know I think it's Laura Mosley who talks about this idea that actually you know is it slipped in the sense that actually if you bend that little model of a spine it could just ping across the room because that's what people are afraid of that a slip disc means my disc has slipped out of place and therefore I better lay down because if I don't and I bend over it'll just ping completely out of place and I think that that is a psychological side of it that that's the belief that they hold and then that belief will influence how they respond to physiotherapy or influence how they respond to the people around them and I think we see that in cake where you've got this person who she's going to um, the hydrotherapy and they said there's been no improvement in the last six months and I just thought, well, for a start, I'm not entirely sure how long ago her accident was, but I have it in my mind. It's probably around about 12 months because mm. yeah, yeah, I think driver is... from what I understood, it was a very short period of time. Um, I mean, I have to say that part of the film really <laughs> infuriated me. Um, I found um, the clinicians involved in her care incredibly invalidating um, yes. and, you know, to kind of contextualise clinical experience you know having if somebody comes and they've had pain for six or 12 months after a traumatic road accident where somebody has died um you know it, it's about validation it's about um accepting the narrative and being with where that person is at you know we in clinic in clinical settings often people don't re reach pain services until Oh, well over five years into their pain journey. And, and, and this is something about the film I felt a little not disingenuous, but poorly researched, you know, be, being generous about it, really, that actually she was being presented as this kind of intransient character who uh, really wasn't trying hard enough. You know, yeah. you need to engage more with your physical exercise and therapy, you know, I'm sure you'll, we'll come on to kind of talk about the uh, the, the separate issue of the of the therapist, <laughs> the psychological therapist. But um, it, this idea of if you tried harder, you, this can get better. This can be solved, and that her issues were around effort. And I yeah. just found the onus in the film on the frustrations of the therapist to be somewhat misplaced, really, and that actually had those therapists repeated exposure to people who'd been through and were going through those experiences I, I think empathy would be more more evident really yeah absolutely she definitely is presented as being this incredibly angry abrasive character mm. and I think that people with chronic pain conditions would probably not necessarily identify themselves as being like that all the time because it really was. It was just that she was irritable because of pain. She was just generally angry at the world and horrible to everybody. So it was a, a very negative portrayal of somebody who was living with the chronic pain that she mm -hmm. had for a start. But then, yeah, she's then rejected by basically everybody. It's this idea that not even her physiotherapist is going to stick with her. You know, you, we haven't had improvement. Maybe you'll do better with somebody else. And I'm thinking, I don't know very many physiotherapists who would just dismiss somebody like that and not least the uh, the group therapist so let's have a chat about that because one of the things that I love doing in these is to pick apart how somebody is portraying therapy and I and the Felicity Huffman character Annette <laughs> I don't know what kind of group therapy that is this idea that you just get a group of people with chronic pain together in a room 
and then be a therapist at them. <laughs> I'm not My sure goodness. what model she's using. Absolutely. Can I just say it was a, a classic example of getting a good therapist and then ringing them of any possible skill and empathy and then putting them in a room with a group of people who were vulnerable and needed emotional support. Uh, it was kind of one of the most bizarre portrayals, really, I thought, of of an effective therapist. Um, you know, the whole, it, it, sitting there, I'm I will be Nina, and this whole you know, Nina being the character that took her took her life, and then saying, "Will you forgive me?" To each that it's not even an empty chair approach. I do not know what that was supposed to be, or what kind of transference she was hoping that she might be able to elicit from the group members. But actually, they further invalidated the the character there because they basically said well she's just too angry to be in group therapy so what do you expect of people with chronic pain conditions who've gone through trauma of course they're bloody angry they've got every right to be angry absolutely I thought that Claire was the only genuine individual in that room you know being the the main character Claire um but I, I I did I feel I felt incensed really around the um the lost opportunities in the film to have an honest and open space for dialogue around suicidal ideation. And I think that that was a real lost opportunity in the film because, you know, if you are living with psychological symptoms of pain, you know, the grief and the loss, and you're living with the physical symptoms of pain, and she was still in a a period of physical recovery from a traumatic road accident, that actually, you know, some days... You, you might wake up and think, what's the point of all of this? You know, what what am I doing on this planet? What, why do I want to be here? And having those thoughts is all right. And, and I think that a really important part of, you know, in psychological therapies around allowing space for people to consider, you know, thoughts around not being here and, and to not have a space to allow people to do that given what she'd been through, and to shut it down, and worse than that, push her out, the group, yeah. was actually, I mean, I'd be getting on the phone to the HCPC. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not not in the realms yeah. of acceptable therapeutic frameworks, really. No, no. And, yeah. and one of my major bugbears, because this kind of thing puts therapy and therapists and psychologists in a really bad light. Because it makes it look like that is what we might do. And we wouldn't do that. Workshops, um, group settings for people with chronic pain are perfect opportunities to explore the biopsychosocial model that we've talked about, to talk about psychoeducation, use things like acceptance and commitment therapy or CBT. And certainly, if you have somebody who is so angry, yes, they may derail a group occasionally, but that's an opportunity to talk about what's going on and the dynamics within the room and then consider separately that person having some one-to-one support, not taking it all away from her, which is what they were doing. And that's the thing. There was no interdisciplinary approach. She had her medical people who were giving her her drugs. She had the hydrotherapist in the pool. She had this therapist who was pushing her out and none of these people were talking to each other. There was no multidisciplinary approach no which ab- absolutely a real missed again another missed opportunity to explore exactly how we would want to support somebody in exactly her position although I don't know what the situation would be in the United States but at the very least she's gone through a trial and one would hope that she would have had some insurance that would cover a multidisciplinary approach to her ongoing difficulties because that's the the point of litigation and compensation in the first place oh absolutely and I mean IASP the International Association for the Study of Pain is you know I'm sure there are swathes of American members and you know the predominant kind of model within that is this interdisciplinary approach Um, I, I know the healthcare system in America works very differently from how it does over here in the UK but um I think it's kind of common belief systems now, particularly in in the scientific community, that interdisciplinary working and supporting the biopsychosocial model is kind of the only real way to address things from a multi-pronged approach. You know, 
you've got somebody who's not coping well in their own physical body. They've got symptoms that they find very distressing, but they've also got psychological factors that are interplaying unhelpfully with the way they manage their physical symptoms. The idea that we can approach that in a very piecemeal or compartmentalized way is quite naive, really, because actually in the same way that we understand the mind and the body to be interlocked and interlinked, the therapists providing that treatment need to be interlocked and interlinked. And that's what interdisciplinary working is. It's not, oh, I get a bit of psychology on a Thursday and physio on a Friday and I see my pain doctor on a Wednesday. It, you know, it's about we're all in a room together. We're, we're fixing the whole. It's a holistic approach. Yeah. And I think she is an example of somebody who would really have benefited from an exploration of those psychological factors. Um, it's very hard to even consider sort of diagnosis and things like that, which is what we would do if she was sort of in the room with us in a medical legal aspect, because actually, you know, with all the pain medication that she's on, it would be hard, and it was hard from the film, to get a real idea exactly of what trauma symptoms she had. But there certainly seemed to be, you know, well, obviously, understandably, a huge grief reaction. And I think that you and I have also both had these conversations about actually from a point of view of that question which we're often faced with from a, a, an instruction point of view in a medical legal field, what is wrong with this person? What label would you give this person? When there's been something as monumental as this, where she has both experienced the, the death of her child and sort of physical difficulties to the point that she is visibly scarred and is in pain all the time, can't even lie down and sleep at night. The idea of then putting a label on that and saying that is post-traumatic stress disorder, that is depression, feels very, very uncomfortable to me, certainly. Mm. And, and, and it doesn't encapsulate the complexity, does it? I think that's the difficulty is that we use these diagnostic manuals like the DSM-5 and the ICD-11, but they, they're just frameworks for understanding constellations of symptoms. They don't they're not designed to be kind of idiosyncratic or bespoke explanations for every presentation that walks into the clinic room. And I think you you kind of, we use them as ways to kind of navigate and understand when symptoms collect together. But I think it's quite naive to take those as kind of a, a full explanatory framework, really, and that they just kind of help us to kind of settle on a direction for therapeutic input. But we need to have those clear complex formulations in these cases which is you know as psychologists that's what we do we don't just diagnose we formulate we understand the patterns of uh, the maintenance cycles between things that are going on as well as kind of complex causation factors yeah and with her you're seeing exactly that you've got a huge trauma response though interestingly she has having a lot of nightmares about uh, Nina who took her life but not about the car accident itself, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm. And throughout the film, I think at the beginning, certainly you're given this idea that she's lying down in the car because of her pain, whereas actually I think it is just well more likely because we see her sit up in the group therapy, she's able to sit in a seated position. It's more likely that that's an avoidance um, of being in the car, although she isn't avoiding car travel. She actually takes unnecessary journeys in the car which you know so there's a lot that's going on there to unpick from a kind of psychological point of view mm. and and therefore I think that that's one of the drawbacks of things like the, the DSM and the ICD as you say they're there to help and actually if you were trying to shoehorn her into a diagnosis it wouldn't be helpful it's much more useful to describe her as being somebody who is highly traumatized contemplating taking her life and coping with chronic pain and then in addition to that these difficulties with the medication so she has Percocet and Oxycontin and she also is med medicating herself with alcohol as well we see that throughout and this is the other thing that angered me actually was that she is given this identity as somebody who's an addict and the reason I think that they try and portray the way the way they portray her as an addict is that she's hiding medication behind a picture. And 
I don't work directly with people who do have opioid addiction, and I know that it is a, a big problem worldwide. But it angered me to see somebody, again, I think pathologised, because I think that that's what they were doing. They were saying that she is so unable to cope with her pain that she's an addict and has to hide her medication. And I'm not sure she would have to do that. No, uh, and I think your anger is justified. I felt similarly, really, that, um, you know, in my clinical practice, um, because we work in sort of a, a complex centre, many of the patients that come through our doors have been on long scripts of um, opioids and, and kind of wanting to titrate down, etc. But I think, again, you know, I think this is sort of the, uh, the soundbite of the session, really, in terms of missed opportunities, it's that there was no discussion around the reciprocal relationship between the system in which Claire inhabits and the role and responsibility of the healthcare provision in terms of that addiction. And we see that a lot. You know, this is a an international issue. You know, it's a massive issue in America, but increasingly so the UK is not far behind in respect to this with opioid consumption. That actually, you know, as clinicians, what are we what are we doing to actually collude with these prescriptions? And what, what are we doing to ensure that people who are vulnerable are not put in a position where they are provided with prescriptions for medications that actually also ease psychological pain? And mm. for me, one of the things that sat very uncomfortably was that this is a woman who's dealt with one of the deepest, most traumatic grief possible um we're very very kind of close time-wise to the to, to the actual road accident and and the death and she's placed on high dosage of opioids jokey chats with the consultant anesthetist pain doctor uh you know i think there was a there was a dialogue wasn't there in the um in the film about um her providing a reference for the doctor's daughter yeah, uh, I think that was a nurse practitioner. I kind of I, I ended up there with her because she seems to need a prescription from a medic and doesn't have it. So yeah, she's Claire's portrayed as kind of almost tricking her into yes. giving her more pain medication. But actually, where was the kind of discussion that precedes that about how she ended up being on that script? Who who authorized yeah. that? You know, who who sat down with her and understood the you know the effect of the psychological trauma of what she'd been through and the vulnerabilities that that presents in terms of red flags for prescribing opioids you know and, and and I think at a level of society we need to take responsibility for protecting vulnerable people and you know the unfortunately the pharmaceutical system and the medical system in which we inhabit you know we don't necessarily have the boundaries that we need and psychological practitioners where they need to be when these scripts get started. Um, and, and I think, you know, the film didn't really allow the opportunity to think about that relationship between Claire and the system. It focused very much on personal responsibility. And again, there's some parallels with that idea, isn't there, of your pain threshold is too low. You're not trying hard enough at your physical therapy. You've been kicked out your psychological therapy group. And now look at you, you're a drug addict. And it, it's like all of that on her, it's your fault. And this is yeah. a woman that's lost her child. Yeah. And, and you think, you know, what, what message is that to her? And the risk that that then has of breaking down any trust or any future trust in anybody who's involved in her medical or psychological care because she's having to justify going back to this person to get more medication she's asked how helpful she finds the support group and lies and says she thinks it's brilliant and you just yeah I just look at it and think everybody along the way is rejecting her and all she is left with is this pain medication and the one person at home who's still looking after her but even that concerns me because you end up with somebody who's potentially she takes her to um get some more pain medication 
in I'm Mexico, assuming across wasn't the border it? in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. it was in Mexico. This that is... was Silvana, wasn't it? Who was like yeah. just a heartwarming character throughout. She's lovely and yeah. sort of facilitating things in a way that, that would be a bit of a flag to me of, of concern, but equally pushing her along. Certainly, towards you see that towards but there was the like a kind of there was an unconditional warmth though, and I think exactly, that actually yeah. that is what Claire needed. She needed unconditional warmth, and okay, you know, driving someone across the border to Mexico to get drugs that you really shouldn't be taking it could could be seen as unhelpful. But actually, if you look at it in the bigger picture, you know, sometimes leaning into people's struggles helps them get out of it, doesn't it? rather than kind of pushing yeah. back and saying you're doing everything wrong. Um, I had a lot more time for Silvana than the therapist. A hundred percent, definitely, because that's what she does. She's just with her, isn't she? She's with her throughout the entire film, and she's with her right at that point where she apparently makes the sudden turnaround and, and she quits the drugs and she seems to be having a different relationship with the physiotherapist. And the end, from that perspective, really, really annoyed me because actually it does reinforce that message that, that Claire just didn't have the determination to begin with mm. to go drug free and to you know really engage with the physiotherapist that was the problem it was her lack of determination and and that suddenly she'd be able to put her seat upright and and face what she'd been through and it's just it was a little bit no it was far too rosy for my liking yeah. it was a bit trite really I thought um, I found I found that part at the end when she kind of sat bolt upright. I found that to be an incredibly contrived situation that wasn't really indicative of what that individual would perhaps do, but more about what the people that produced and wrote the film thought the audience perhaps wanted or needed. Uh, yeah. and it, la- it lacked a lot of depth, I thought, in that regard. Yeah. Yes, there was a lot there that, that the film, I felt overall... I thought that Jennifer Aniston did an amazing job of portraying somebody with chronic pain. I just think that her acting was superb. There were no Oscar winning moments of just losing it. And it just, it wasn't like that because it was so much more real. And I think in so many ways, the film did a really good job at that, even going down to the film poster where she's almost faded out as if she's almost sort of of lost. At least, yes, less of a person than she used to be, that kind of thing. And I feel that the end of the film with this sudden, it's as if you know, she, she took what appears to potentially have been an accidental overdose and, and it's around that point that something suddenly clicks inside her and everything within days is turned on its head and everything's great. And mm. I think the one of the things that people who are, who are standing on the edges of somebody, somebody's life who's living with chronic pain I think the idea that that they would see that and think actually it's going to take one moment and this person will be able to pick themselves up and just get on with it and they'll be fine within a matter of days they'll turn it all around is so disingenuous mm. that it's as simple as just discovering some inner strength and I that as as you say it, it missed some nuance it missed some complexity towards the end it became far more simplistic. As a, I think so. as a resolution. I, I mean, I, I, part of me felt there would have been um, kind of more strength in the film, really, if they had not reassured the audience that everything was OK. Because yeah. what we're talking about is living with chronic loss. And, and when I say that, I mean chronic loss of physical function, persistent pain, but the chronic loss of a child. And I think... The idea that we reach a point, as you've just said, that we cross a threshold of functioning and we kind of, you know, get back on track, get the suit back on, you know, get showered every morning. We, we know that that isn't how people get back to psychological health. We know that it undulates and things are not good some days and things are better other days. And it was just another example, really, of how I felt that the film wanted to kind of close down difficult dialogue, close down discussion around things that society as a whole finds difficult to discuss like institutional promotion of drug addiction suicidal ideation um you know living with chronic illness and 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 these things that you know we don't want to acknowledge that that's happening around us and 
And why, why would we want to do that in a film? We want to go away and have a nice, nice night's sleep. Uh, but there is there are some key issues in there, really, that weren't addressed full, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and going back to what we were talking about before with regards to the opioid addiction, one of the other things that, that angers me about it, not least because in that pivotal moment, she does sort of go cold turkey and it concerns me. It concerns me greatly that she suddenly does that. But also in, there are people out there who, because of the the opioid addiction sort of epidemic around the world, really struggle when they then do go into hospitals and A&E settings. I'm thinking, for example, of people with um, intermittent porphyria and things like that, where they know that they need to have a particular medication in order to control their difficulties or a flare. And they will be viewed as being people who are mentally addicted to this medication. And it is very much put forward, I think, with her as being, this is a mental addiction. And yet, clearly, you know, potentially 12 months after an accident that's left her massively scarred and with, I think they said, pins in her legs and all sorts of things, that she would suddenly be able to just quit the medication because it was all in her head. I, I kind of got a bit of a feeling of that at the end that yeah. you know she could cope without it if she again if she just tried hard enough and um, that absolutely me. and you know we, we said right at the beginning didn't we about this biopsychosocial model and something that I talk about in my clinical practice all the time is that it, it's okay to take medication if you're in pain I think you know it's funny isn't it because even when we look at messages around acute pain and we look at women in childbirth and we think about you know oh did you have any pain medication oh no I did it I did it just with eucalyptus leaves or, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I didn't even notice that I'd given birth, to be honest. You know, this just sort sneezed. of this, um, yeah, 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 I sneezed. It was fine. Oh, no, it didn't hurt. You know, there's this sort of narrative, isn't there, around having a high pain threshold that gives you sort of a strength of character. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, th- th- there's no prizes for that at all. But yet it's a narrative that persists. And that's kind of an example in an acute pain setting. Now, if you translate that to somebody who's really struggling with chronic pain, that actually the idea that we take away potentially a really effective strategy, which is pain medication, that is what it's been designed for, that we can effectively take strong medications for pain not be mentally addicted, not take it for the wrong reason and use them effectively and appropriately. But it's about the system supporting that and making sure that you've also got psychological support. You know, biopsychosocial means treat medically, psychologically and socially. And we don't have to say, you know, you have to deal with this just by thinking yourself out of it. You know, these are these are real physical symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. So generally, I think that you possibly came to very similar conclusions that I did about the film, which is that in so many ways, they do represent somebody who is experiencing trauma and chronic pain very well from the point of view of an individual actress. Mm. But what they've lost sight of potentially is the wider complex picture and inadvertently perhaps while it's great that there's a film out there that's drawing attention to chronic pain, because there aren't many, yeah. let's face it. Absolutely. It's it's missed an opportunity and perhaps it's going to be perpetuating some sort of myths about pain and sort of stoicism and determination and sort of overcoming the odds that, that we don't, as psychologists and people who work within a chronic pain setting, see as being something which is truthful Mm, absolutely yeah I I I would completely agree with that I think when I was thinking about talking about this with you I was thinking if I had to kind of sum it into a few words I I think stereotyping underwhelming and lost opportunities (laughs) were the were the sort of things you know which which sounds negative because I, I I completely also on the other hand agree you know I think Jennifer Anderson did Aniston did a fantastic job individually portraying somebody in distress absolutely you know it was kind of the narrative around her that lost that lost out that that that, that didn't support her which is interesting really because it sort of parallels what we're saying that you know the individual was really trying and was good but you know the framework around her was perhaps less effective at, at doing that um but I think it's fantastic that 
there is a film that focuses almost exclusively on the experience of chronic pain because I can't really think of any other films of such a similar ilk where it's so central to the narrative. So from that regard, um, I found it refreshing, really. Refreshing at least that the, the narrative had opened. Yes, yeah, it would be good if there could be more consideration of that as being a, a central part of a film, but perhaps without perpetuating myths about opioid addiction mm. and, yeah, as we say, stoicism and determination. Thank you very much for joining me today. This has been really interesting to talk to you about this. And I think it's a really good film that lends itself really well to exactly what these podcasts are about, which is about sort of, as well as formulating somebody's difficulties, picking a part where actually we don't see a film meeting the um, the psychological reality that, that we would like films to be representing a little bit more frequently. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great having having a chinwag about the film. You know me, I always love having a chat about chronic pain. Um, you know, I, I think my kind of final sort of sign off really is it's this idea of it's kind of OK to not be OK. And I know that that's something that we kind of talk about now on social media. But I think the film kind of misses that really and that it's all right to talk about not not feeling all right with stuff whether that's physical or psychological. You've been listening to Analyse This, mental health in film and TV. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. My guest was Dr Hannah Bashforth and we were discussing the film Cake. Music by Joseph McDade and post-production editing by David Woods. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to like and subscribe. Help others find the show by telling your friends and leaving us a review on whatever platform you're using. And get in touch via Facebook and Twitter at The Doctor Boo and let me know if there are any films or shows you'd like me to talk about. I'll see you next time. <laughs>